Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Dead Man's Chess. In the game Dead Man's Chess, you're playing a chess-like game in which you're going to be choosing one of four factions, and you'll be going around the board taking your turn, attempting to defeat your opponent's pieces. There are three phases per turn. You have the boost phase, you're going to have the battlefield phase, and then the promotion phase. On your turn, you'll move pieces, you will roll dice, you will draw cards, you will attack, and you will hopefully promote your pawns if they reach the other side of the board. Up until the point where the last battlefield card has been drawn from the deck, in which case you will tally up all the points that you have remaining on the field, and whoever has the most is the winner. Will you succeed in this battlefield chess style game or will you be left in the dust with no pieces remaining on the board? Find out after I explain how to set the game up, how to play, and then my review. In the game Dead Man's Chess, it's very, very simple how to set the game up. You'll first choose one of the many battlefields and you will place it down on the field. Based on the number of players, there'll be a different setup. In a four player game, this is how it looks. Basically two sides of a chess board. But when you're playing a three player game, there's specific rules and guidelines as to where you set your pieces up, which you can find in the rule book. After you have placed all your chess pieces according to the normal rules of chess or in the three player version based on the board slash rule book, then you're going to gather your faction sheet based on the faction that you chose. There are multiple factions. You have the pirates, you're going to have the vikings, uh, Cthulian style mythos, and then of course the like undead mummies. Uh, your board is going to reflect that specific class. It'll have its own unique abilities as well as its own unique saga deck its own unique runestone deck, and of course a battlefield deck in which you're going to get nine cards. If you have any remaining cards for all the players that are not being used, you can set them aside. So everybody should have their own two decks plus nine battlefield card decks. And all your pieces are set up. Place the two dice somewhere within reach of all players, and all of these stands that you're going to be using to add to your characters to hopefully give them the unique abilities near players as well. After that, the game's pretty much ready to go. Pretty simple, right? So let's talk about how to play. On your turn, you're going to follow the three phases of your turn sequence, the first being the boost phase, in which case you'll roll the die, select one of the three different things you can do, and then hopefully perform that action. There are three main things. One is your class ability, whether it be the necromancers bringing their characters back to life, or whether it be the vikings who sacrifice in order to gain benefit. You'll roll the die, and then based on that roll, you can also potentially gain different cards, like ritual cards or necronomicon cards, etc, etc. They're basically like epic epic acts and boosts. Boosts require a roll of a 6 plus, and if you roll a 5, you can add a plus 1 for every two pieces you've removed. So if you roll a 3 and you have two pieces removed, that's a 4. If you roll a 3 and you have four pieces, that's a 5. You need a 6 to get one of those cards, uh, the basic boost cards. For the epic axe, you're going to need an 8, and the same rules apply. For every two pieces that you do not have, that you've lost, it's going to give you a plus one on your roll. If you draw a boost card, you have to use it right away. It'll say something like, the king uh, may also be used for the raid faction ability, which will be based on the character that you're choosing. Um, or if you draw a saga card, or this epic act, I should say, uh, you can use this card whenever you so choose. This is like the most powerful ability, and it's the only one that you can keep without having to use on the turn that you draw it. And of course, the last one is like your main class ability, which requires a certain roll of the die. Some of them are going to require you to roll a 2 or a 5 or a 7. It's really going to be based on the specific uh, choice of like character class that you use. After you have rolled for the boost phase and hopefully perform one of those three things, you move on to the battlefield phase. During the battlefield phase, you'll draw one of your battlefield deck cards, and you can then choose to either do your base movement or you can choose to use your card, and you can do that in any order. If your card tells you to do something, you have to fulfill it unless there is an and or statement, in which case you can potentially fulfill one or the other, but if you cannot do your card at all, you'll simply move upon instead. For your basic movement, it functions very similarly to chess, but there are certain rules that change based on what you are playing, what, level, what number of players in the game you're playing. For instance, pawns will be able to move side to side in a three-player game. Uh, normally, they'll be able to move two spaces uh, on their first move, and sometimes more depending on what you're playing as well. And then, of course, using the cards here. This will let you move your king two times. Now, in a normal game of chess, uh, all these pieces uh, you should look up somewhere else. So you know, I'm not going to explain every single piece of movement, but I 
will do like a very bland scenario. King will basically be able to move one space in a direction. Queen can move all spaces up, down, left, right, or side to side. You've got these guys here. These are bishops. They can move in an X formation. You've got the horses that move in an L. It's usually going to be three and two. And then you have these guys here, your rooks, uh, the castles. These are the ones that are going to move all the way up, all the way down, left and right. They're like little crosses. And for the most part, all the pieces move like that. But there are some exceptions and there are some rules, like you can't on passant, etc., etc. And you can look all those up in the rules. But basically, you'll move one of your pieces and then you'll perform the card if you possibly can, allowing you to move that specific piece one or two times or whatever it says on there. And that would be your turn. Uh, you'll check to see at the end of your turn if you promoted something. And to promote something, you have to get one of your pieces to an end point of an opponent's side. So if you can get your pawn all the way across the board or on side to side when you're playing with multiple players, you are going to be able to basically promote that character to any character that you've lost. So if you lost this rook and you got your pawn all the way across the board, you can replace your pawn with the rook that you lost. So attacking. Let's talk about attacking before we talk about phases of the turn, more et cetera, et cetera. So basically what's going to happen is whenever you want to attack. So if you have a pawn and you have another pawn and you want to attack, uh, this pawn moves up and then you choose on your turn to attack. You're going to basically put your pawn uh, next to that space saying that you're going to attack it. The attacker will roll their dice. The defender will then roll their dice. You will tally up both die for each player and then you will check the attack of the attacker and the defense of the defender. If the defender reaches the same number as the attacker or greater, the defender wins. If the attacker is higher than the defender, the attacker wins. The winner removes the opposing piece from the board. If the defender loses, the defender will have one more shot to roll a die and get a six plus. And if they do, they will bring their character back, putting it on the space it was currently at and remaining the attacker in a space that was adjacent to it in its closest possible attacking position. So the defender will kind of have two chances and the attacker will only have one, but the attacker is going to have a higher number when it comes to attacking. Additionally, when playing these boost cards and epic cards, sometimes you're going to be able to add these cards to certain factions or certain types of pieces, and you can place them on your specific piece, and it'll give you a benefit. Maybe it'll let the pawn move move an additional space every turn, or maybe it'll let you attack twice, or it will attack until it can no longer attack, etc, etc. And these things will remain on there. You can only have one of these per piece, and sometimes you can replace, or choose to replace these guys with uh, new cards. But that's pretty much the idea of the game. You're going to be attempting to go across the board, defeating your opponent's pieces. You will be rolling to attack whenever you're in attack position, rolling the two die, and your defender rolling the uh, die as well. And if you can get that higher number you will succeed in attacking and why do you want to do that well to win the game when this last card of this deck has been drawn you're going to check to see how many pieces you have left and each of these pieces is worth victory points just like in a normal game of chess every piece has a value and if you have the most value on your board compared to any other player you will win the game but be quite careful because everybody else is attempting to do that as well so that's the idea let's talk about my review Dead Man's Chess is a chess game. Now, of course, it's not exactly chess because there's quite a bit of luck in it and chess has basically no luck. It's all perfect information, but this is going to satisfy the tactical RPGers fantasy of playing chess on a board. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that old Star Wars game of chess and there's other ones that it kind of reminds me of as well. Like World of Warcraft, how I went through one of those raids and you had to play chess with the uh, opposing uh, uh, enemy AI. It's, it's similar in, in that regard because you have the different factions, they have different abilities, they have different cards that they'll utilize, and of course the battlefield decks will let them move additional characters. On your turn, you're not just simply moving one piece and hoping to attack. Uh, in this game, you will move a piece, you potentially move another piece, and then you can move another piece based on the battlefield cards that you're going to be getting in the game. That, and also, you have special abilities on your character board, and being able to choose them is very, very nice. Uh, these are rituals or boosts and these epic acts are going to be very, very powerful. Uh, some of them are going to let you basically move your rook or ignore um, any number of spaces up until the space you want to attack with. Uh, others are going to let you look at the top five ritual cards in your deck and play one immediately and then place the remaining four back on top in any order. That's an epic card. It's very, very powerful. Uh, every card is used when you draw it or not used, which is also nice in the game. It makes things very easy to understand. Uh, only the epic acts are special and you can hold them. So it's something that's pretty straightforward. And you're like, okay, I know that all these cards have to be played and if they can't be played, they're gone, except for this special one, which is the epic one. 
And the abilities are unique too to each character. I like how you can choose to sacrifice to gain a benefit or have a chance to bring back a character in order to basically get more victory points in order to succeed in the game. All of that works very, very well. Now, most classic chess players uh, uh, like myself, but not including myself, uh, are typically interested in playing a chess game that's very, very, very luck reduced. Uh, but when you meet the modern gamer and you throw in chess like this, it becomes more of an interesting like combination. I really, really enjoyed this game. This was a lot of fun to not only watch, but also play and learn the different requirements in order to succeed what you're trying to do. Attacking isn't as straightforward. You may or may not want to attack, and sometimes you may want to defend instead. And in fact, that can lead to a little bit of turtling in this game. That's the one problem I would see with this game is that you can turtle. And the solution to it is the victory condition. At the end of the game, whoever has the most points on the board is the winner, but I would actually personally change it to whoever has captured the most pieces of points is the winner. And uh, you can set the tiebreaker for this one as well. So just kind of like flip flop those because it will prevent players from kind of protecting their characters and not wanting to go off onto the offensive. I like this style of chess game because it's more about just attacking. It doesn't matter if your king survives, your queen survives, they're important pieces, but they can go. It's not going to be the end all be all of the game, whereas in, in classic chess, you're very likely to lose if you are going to be missing your queen very early and of course if you get checkmated. There's no checkmate in this game. This game is all about tactical decisions, deciding based on the die rolls so whether you're going to succeed or not, whether you can use your battlefield deck or your boosts or your epic axe, and it all plays in a role. Um, a little, another little thing too is the boost phase. I love the different actions you can choose and how you can gain your cards and how there's kind of a catch-up mechanic for if you've lost a lot of pieces you can start getting most likely epic axe and boosts easier than other players players, but it says you roll a die and choose one. And for some of them, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense how that works. Do I roll the die and then based on the roll, I select what I can do, or do I choose one, roll the die, and if I succeed, do I get it? Uh, it's just a little bit unclear, which I'm pretty sure they'll they'll explain in the rules for the Kickstarter of this game. Um, and I'll probably have that understood uh, for our live stream when we push this out for you guys. Uh, but that was one other little thing. So turtling, and then of course, just the small rules clarification for the boost says. But otherwise, as far as movement works, as far as attacking works, utilizing your cards, changing the way in which the pieces move based on the cards that you get and where they go onto certain pieces is really, really cool. It's a lot of fun. And the fact that each of the characters function differently is also cool as well. The Necromancer is probably my favorite, uh, the undead, I should say, the ones that come back to life. But they might be a little more powerful than the others. I'm not sure. I have to play this game a whole lot to really determine if that's the truth or not. But in one of our games, the Necro characters, the undead characters, were brought back quite a few times and it's of course only one for each different type of piece but it can give you a good point score total especially if you're using the totaling strategy in the game. Uh, regardless, let's talk about the other stuff in the game. The quality. This game has beautiful miniatures. They are high quality. They are really thick. They're really nice. You can tell what pieces are what based on what you're playing as. I don't think anybody really had an issue with determining what this was compared to what this is because they're very, very distinctly shown on these pieces here. Uh, and Maybe a newer player might have an issue with that, but as for other players, no. In fact, uh, getting this game alone just for the miniatures or the figures that I could use for chess is very, very enticing. Even buying two sets so that I could have two... In fact, what I would suggest in the Kickstarter is for them to just sell two sets of each of these so that people can use them for their chess boards. That's how cool these are, especially the Cthulhu ones. These are probably one of my favorite looking sets of chess pieces. And I would like to own two sets so I could have it for my own specific wooden chess board that I have here at home quality excellent. Uh, the different boards are really cool too. It has different battlegrounds, has different artwork and everywhere, and it all looks really, really nicely. It's easy to tell the difference between which of the different squares interact, even with this more complicated board. How all of your stuff works is pretty simple. Stated on your board here, you can have your turn fully set up as well of all the places to put your cards. So the graphic design was really well done as well, in my opinion. And overall, it's a really, really fun game. Um, I want to just be enticed to attack more, and I want to be able to lose pieces without as much fear, because I'm gaining pieces. Whereas one player sits, up, sits out in the game and we're all fighting, and then in the end they win because they just kind of hung, hung away from battle. I want to see that fight happen. And so for me, probably I'd house rule uh, the reverse victory conditions. But otherwise, it's a solid game. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of really cool pieces and cards and abilities, and you're trying to keep track of everything in this really cool RPG, chess strategy, luck-based game. Uh, if you like chess and you like RPGs, this is going to be one for you to take a look at.
Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Dead Man's Chess. If you're interested in picking up the game, there's a link down below in the description where you can pick this up on Kickstarter. If you'd also like, you check out our website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, Kickstarter lists, and more. Every Sunday night, we stream, and we stream um, games just like this one. It's on Facebook and on Twitch at 6.30 p.m. PST, and in fact, we will be streaming this one so you can see how the game is played. And of course, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe to this channel and hit that bell notification button. And as always, I look forward to defeating your queen uh, next time. I was gonna say king, but in this game, it's not as relevant to defeat the king. The queen's a little more powerful, so you, you, you get it.